he was the best player I played against. And, and, and I say this respectfully. Two Jordan. dribble, pump fake, reverse spin. Celebrity. Maybe now you can say, yeah, I didn't play a second. But in five years, you guys are going to forget. In 10 years, I'll still be a champ. In 20 years, I'll tell my kids I probably started. And in 30 years, I probably told them I got the MVP. So I'm really not too worried about it. How do you describe the White Mamba? The man who won an NBA championship without even needing to step on the court, just from the fear he would strike in his opponent. A guy who could knock it down from anywhere, finish with his balls at the rim, and take your girl in the meantime all while having the freshest cut in the NBA. A career that withstood the test of time to slot in as the greatest- just kidding, that was pretty shit. There might be no one more loved by the NBA community than Big Scal. His goofy personality, goofier appearance, and lack of playing time transformed him into the OG basketball meme, known by many as the greatest and by morons as the worst of all time. Let's relive the legacy of the White Mamba. Born in Long Beach, California before moving to a medial-sized burb in Washington State, picking up the game a little later around the start of high school, he quickly became obsessed. He was lucky enough to have a friend group that was also very into the game, although not to anywhere near the same level. Despite passion being there, the talent clearly was not, as even in junior high, he was playing on the B team where against a bunch of bums, he would get shots up for two hours a day. And then after practice, go play until dark at the park. He got what he says was his 10,000 hours of practice in before he was half competitive, but in the meantime, he certainly didn't look like a kid that was league bound. Playing no time on JV as a freshman to a JV role as a sophomore and a minor role on varsity as a junior, it was certainly not overnight with this guy, as his very choppy style of play mixed with his natural unathleticism being kind of slow, clunky big guy tripping over his own feet made him look like quite the low ceiling kind of guy. There was a lot of chatter about how far he could really run with this, as workouts, weight room, and practice were pretty much the only things he enjoyed. Yet despite standing about 5 inches taller than anyone on the team, he really wasn't that talented of a guy. Even after putting together a pretty decent senior campaign when expanding out of the local area at things like his sole year of AAU and other scouting events, he was pretty quickly humbled by the excess of much superior talent elsewhere. For this reason, Scout was kind of a nobody outside of Enumclaw, Washington, and was forced to take his talents to Highline Community College. There are disadvantages to playing at this level opposed to a high major school. Obviously your competition will be ramped up, facilities, okay. training programs, and coaching will be more catered to the level you're playing at, but Juco is still pretty tough basketball if you want to admit it or not. Playing at a much faster pace than the high school level, having access to all the facilities you could need, and likely having more time to utilize it than a high major athlete. Scal sure as hell utilized every bit of the opportunity he had to. Rounding lifting practice, he didn't have much of a break. In the tighter knit community than most, he was even able to get into the Sonics arena at this time and run up some games with guys trying out for the big leagues. His game, physicality, and conditioning all skyrocketed from the work he was doing, and after averaging just short of 16, 10, and 3 with a rip a game and a state chip, he still had absolutely no recruiting. There wasn't a very big market for slow-footed white guys, reigning threes in Juco. But other than basketball, he really didn't know much of anything. And while attending shoot rounds out of state in Southern California, he started to realize that the talent that was light years ahead of him just a year ago, all of a sudden, wasn't too far away. Scout got noticed by USC, and along with Juco teammate Quincy Wilder, they were now a part of the Trojans. Quincy was the star guard at Highline, known for his athleticism, stampeding to the basket. But after cutting class, getting benched on the team, and being arrested for robbery and second degree assault, he was sent to prison and is now employed at the YMCA. It's safe to say it went a little bit better for Brian. After popping on the red shirt for a year, he was close to an instant star at this level. He would keep up with anyone. He was known as the workhorse of the team and putting up all American numbers of near 15 and 6. Dude was a smart and skilled player. There wasn't an ounce of flash, but he could get to the line, knock down shots, make the extra pass, and kick out a double. So, I mean, for a basketball nerd or a coach, he's probably your favorite player. But for anyone else, you probably don't give two shits how hard his screens were. Serving as a captain of sort for the next two years, Scow ramped up his numbers to 18 and 6 on 53 and 40 shooting splits, then 15 and 6 on a team that made a run to the Elite Eight. Scow might be one big joke, but he's also a campus legend. 
Efficient 16 and 6 averages with memorable moments like a pair of big shots against the Blue Devils in 01 made his college campaign nothing to scoff at, and start to illustrate why a guy who's warming the JV bench a few years ago was now buying a suit for the NBA draft. Landing 34th overall to the New Jersey Nets was an interesting position, as coming into the league on one of the best teams in the NBA, you obviously are doing whatever you can to contribute to the team in any way, shape, or form, since the pretty crazy depth on this team left for pretty little weak points. The heightened competition mixed with the injuries combined for Scott only getting in 28 games, with an inefficient 2-2 two two average before lagging up in the NBA Finals playing a total of 1 minutes and uh, not recording any stats. The following year, Scout really climbed the ladder, jumping to 3 points per game, and another single minute in the Finals. It's easy to point and laugh at his lack of a role at this time. In the finals, he had as bout of a good a chance to get in as I did. But over the regular season, Scott was still a contributing piece of the team. Starting in seven games this year, he was a part of a very competitive rotation, which is harder to get into than most people would expect, as you're pretty much always expected to add value every second of the game. He may not have been a killer role player, but going out and embracing his role is a lot more than you get from a lot of guys sitting at the end of the bench. When you left him open, he was a 36% three ball guy, able to expand the floor. When it's not there, he moved it to a guy who could create better than him, then went 110% on the defensive end. This always ready to go mentality ended up paying off for him, as in his fourth year he would clock 21 minutes a game and 6 points to pair. This isn't anything crazy of course, but major moments like game 5 against the Pistons when he basically won the Nets the game with 17 points on 6 for 7 shooting showed that if you're going to give this guy the minutes, he's going to do the most with them. Bouncing off a career best season, Scout was able to lock up a 5 year $15 million deal with the Celtics. This was a big commitment for a guy who was too slow to beat anyone, wasn't a good rebounder at all, and was not physically gifted enough to excel as a defender, or really even be that serviceable. The only skill he had at the NBA level was his jump shot in all honesty, but as a guy who you can trust to throw into the game and give 110% without trying to steal the show and do too much, it makes sense to give this guy a roster spot over a lot of other options. Scout grew to be a garbage time legend in New Jersey, but that escalated even more after two mediocre seasons at Boston. The White Mamba was officially unleashed at this time. The red-headed gunslinging backup grew to be probably the most famous bench warmer of all time. And after a depleting role with Kevin Garnett joining the Celtics and his time in the NBA starting to add up, he embraced the memes even more. After a season putting up a staggering 1.8 a game, Scalperny would add to his empty resume with an NBA championship in which he played zero seconds. After this notorious run, Scal would go on the next few years basically playing garbage time minutes with a couple minor roles as infrequent injury replacements. He even landed one more payday with the Bulls where he became known for his emphatic high fives and head nodding during timeouts. After a two year run averaging one point, Scal hung him up totaling a 10 year career. Despite being the biggest meme in basketball history, Brian actually put up a very long and memorable career. Yes, it's understandable why he's looked at as one of the worst players ever, as partly due to his parents and partly due to him being one of the least talented players naturally, he did really seem like the average Joe facing up against the best players in the world. But as seen by his recent series giving some incredibly talented players ass whoopings in one on one, he's nowhere close to a scrub. He was able to edge out a career far longer than the average player just through hard work, humility, and a high IQ on the floor. There's a reason he's got plenty of attention from coaching staffs ever since he hung him up. No matter what you want to say, he did what he loved to do and made tens of millions in the process. You can make fun of him all you want, I mean I'll probably keep doing the same thing, but for 99% of us he'd probably be the best fucking player we'll ever share the floor with.